Welcome back to the Milwaukee Market Update. We're covering real estate news and data and break it down to help you understand how it impacts your real estate decisions. Teaser, where are the buyers at? Where are they at, though? Where are they at? Where are they at? Uh, what's the takeaway this episode? Massive news. The Fed has just cut rates by 50 basis points. Um, we saw a steep decline in pending home sales month over month, not only just in Milwaukee, but nationally as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and then let's talk about Airbnbs, short-term rentals, and big events that happened in Milwaukee in Milwaukee and what's the impact of the economy here. And then also are nine drinks per person at a wedding. Is that enough? Will it be enough? Will it be enough? Ty's going to tell us. I got the answer for you. Yes. Most important data point we've shared in the life of the podcast. Yeah. So we're here to give you the info you need to make the right decisions regarding your real estate. Should I buy a home now? Should I be selling? Is the housing market about to crash? Are these headlines I'm reading content I'm seeing on social media true or even relevant to me? If you're new to the show returning because you found value in our previous videos, it would mean the world to us if you could take a second to subscribe. You can follow us at tyash31 and nickharrington28 or reach out via milwaukeemarketupdate.com. I'm Ty. I'm Nick. With Compass, your local real estate experts. Let's go ahead and dive into some of the quick tips. I think one that's super important this time of the year for our home buyers that are out there is lease timing Mm -hmm. and starting that I, we have negotiating, you know, new lease terms with them, but honestly, I think it's more of like communication best practices. What would be a couple tips you'd give somebody who's like, I know I'm trying to move sometime soon. It might be this year. It might be going into spring next year. What's your best tip? Yeah. I think if you're, if you know you're going to buy a home in the next 12 months, your lease, if you're in a lease and you're renting becomes kind of the most important thing for you. If you're in a year long lease that either becomes your timeline of, okay, I have to make a decision by this date. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's number one. I think if you know you're going to move in the next year and buy a home, if you can get on a month to month lease and some apartments are okay with that, some probably won't honor that whatsoever, but that gives you the ultimate flexibility to be sure that your back is never against a wall where it's like, I need to find a place in two weeks. Otherwise I'm living in my apartment for another year. Yeah. Not a good spot to be in. Cause then it's like, then you give your notice and you may not be past home inspection or appraisal. And there can be, you know, catches along the way of the home purchasing process. Yeah. And the other thing I would say overall is like, you might want to pay a little bit more month to month to give yourself the flexibility of when you can actually deliver notice. Mm -hmm. Because usually one of the main questions I get is rent is due on the first for most places, right? So what's different about buying your home is if you closed on today, September 24th, your first rent payment isn't going to be October 1st. It's going to be November 1st. So you actually get a little bit of wiggle room when you buy your home because you actually are paying that monthly payment after you've lived in the month in the yeah. house for a month. And so. your mortgage payment, technically, you don't need to pay it until the 15th. It's yeah. so due on the 1st, no penalty <laughs> until the 15th. Yeah. So you could pay up until the 14th yeah. with no penalty. does not affect your credit. So it even gives you a little bit more of a buffer time if yeah. you are paying two mortgages or two rent payments at once. Just really land that plane as you do that transition. Because that's yeah. one of the hardest things is you know trying to transition from your current yes. living situation to the next one. So a couple also, of tips for on you that then too. Because I think one of the hardest positions as a home buyer is your lease expires in two months and you're starting that search today. Yeah. Um, what would you say optimal time for someone that their lease ends on a certain date? How much before their lease end date would you say is the time to kind of start and just ramping up the whole home buying process? Four to six months. If you've like already been spending two months talking, you know, th- or d- working through yourself or with your partner that you might be buying your home with, like you kind of need that, like that month or two of kind of just like dabbling in the market to kind of figure out needs, wants, deal breakers. And then you need kind of those two months to shop and have like eight weeks worth of checking out homes and starting to learn the off writing process. And then that like month to close, but really you're going to have to give 60 days notice for a lot of these rental apartments. So I'd say four weeks is like probably smack dab on that perfect mark. As long as you know four exactly months. four months, as long as you know exactly kind of what you're looking for, because you've done some of that initial research already, yeah. which cool. your agent can help you through some of that research, but I'd say four months. Cool. Love yeah. it. So for the homeowners out there, this is, we're going to dive into this a little bit more on this episode of the market is starting to slow a bit. Seasonality is a bit of that market drop last month in August uh, for the stock market, as well as an election cycle. What should you do when your home sits in the market for a alarming seven days? <laughs> right. And I kind of say that jokingly, but it's like, what's the actual strategy or framework you can follow on? Like, how should I maybe change the price of my home? Usually I coach up all my homeowners on is 3%. 5%, 7%, 7%. 
And this is all based off of like the activity we get and the feedback we get from showings performed by agents and their buyers. This so is once your home is listed. Once your home's listed. Okay. It's been, I would say typically you list on a Thursday. No activity is really needed on pricing changes in that first seven to 10 days. But after we've had that first 10 days of activity, we can make a decision of no change, very small change. Sometimes it's even a thousand dollar price change just to reactivity, reactivate those Zillow and mm-hmm. realtor.com feeds and get it back up to consumers top of their inbox. If you're getting consistent showings, but no real talk of offers, 3% price correction. If showings are slow and kind of spotty in between, we might be looking at like more of a 5%. And if it's crickets, no one's coming in, we're talking 7%. And it gives us at least a game plan to maybe target some price points. There might be some plays where maybe you're in the the high 300s. Well, there might be a play to take a more aggressive haircut on the price to get people below a $350,000 threshold Mm -hmm. and might re-engage them based on filters people use on realtor.com and Zillow. Yeah, I love it. I also think too, a lot of times we see these price drops reignite kind of that sort of auction or bidding war mentality. Mm -hmm. You know, like there's times where there's a home listed for sale for two months, they drop the price. And then all of a sudden three offers come in and they end up mm-hmm. getting that original price that they had it listed at before they did the price drop. So a price drop isn't necessarily always bad. Mm-hmm. It could still reignite some of this bidding war frenzy, just depending on how aggressive or, or where it goes. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I, I love this idea. It, it's a little bit of a leap of faith taking oh, yeah. that more aggressive move. Yeah. But we have to actually understand, like, are you at one of those thresholds where you're above a certain amount where people might not even have your home in the filter to begin with yep. based on medium price point that might be there in your location? So it's always go- good to go into that strategy. And I like to share mm-hmm. these tips because I would say it's most home, or actually I say like half of all homes do get an accepted offer in those first seven to 10 days. The other half don't. So it's something that you should really be talking about, especially as we go through a change market, as we go back to a more traditional market where homes don't just evaporate in three days. Yeah. Which uh, also we kind of been spoiled to be in that market too for a while. As as sellers have. Sellers (laughs) have. Sellers have absolutely been spoiled into this kind of market where, so, and I don't want to dive too much into this in the quick tip section, because I think we'll talk more about that in this episode. For sure. And what do you have for investors out there? Yeah. For investors. So I... I work with a lot of investors, Mm -hmm. as you know, and I get calls a lot from people I've never spoken to, um, never, don't really have a relationship with, and they ask, hey, do you have any deals? Or do you have anything that'd be good for me to flip? And my biggest tip is you need, as an investor, to buy into your market. And to me, what that means is you need to give back to your investing community to get a leg up on the competition. Yep. The people that are getting the best deals, the people that are reaping the rewards of good buy opportunities or first dibs at off market opportunities mm-hmm. are the ones that are putting the time in to build the relationships with the players in the area and in, sure. in the community. Um, and so that could mean attending just local real estate networking meetings or here in Milwaukee, we have the, uh, RIA, Real Estate Investors Associations. They do yep. happy hours. You host happy hours. Yep. Um, putting yourself out there and then also letting everyone you know in that market that, hey, I am an investor. Here's kind of what I'm looking for because that's how you get the deals. Yep. Um, that's how we, I think every property that we've ever flipped, we've gotten those kind of deals from word of mouth because yep. people know who we are because we've got good reputations. Um even wholesalers that we work with, they're going to be like, Hey, I know you guys do this. Like, do you want first dibs at this? Cause I know you guys are easy to work with and have a good reputation. And that's yep. what ultimately your real goal should become is you want people, you want to be top of mind for people. Yeah. And even for us that people that support investors, here's like two common things I hear as I go through like an introductory phone call, they might say, Hey, I'm a uh, new and uh, yeah. Do you have any deals or can you just tell me like where I need to go invest versus somebody that says, hey, I'm planning on coming to visit. I'm going to drive around the neighborhoods, but I think I like this neighborhood. What do you think about those neighborhoods? I'm really excited to meet you in person and kind of learn a little bit more. And like, who do you recommend I get in contact with? Like having some base knowledge and a plan to invest and buy into the market, which I think is your tip overall is those are two different people. Somebody who's saying, tell Mm -hmm. me everything that I need to know and hopefully I can find a deal for someone. It's like, I'm going to go be proactive and actually invest into the relationships here. 
you're going to lean into as an agent supporting somebody that is willing to be receptive as opposed to trying to pull them through. Cause it feels super like risky to just tell somebody like, yeah, it's a good deal. It's like, it totally depends on your goals, who you are, right. your personal position, which we can't dig into every single intricacy yeah. of your personal situation. You have to know what you want yeah. and actually articulate how you, how you're going to find it and start partnering with these people in the market. Yeah. You get, you get out what you put in. Yeah. At the Absolutely. end of the day, in anything in life, you know, investing is no different. Absolutely. And it's just consistency over time. If you keep on showing up, popping into market, going to meetups, people are going to start recognizing you and want to help you because they see you putting the effort forth. Absolutely. Uh, all right. So the story of this month, just overall market anecdote, obviously pretty much everyone at this point has gotten a, a message probably from their insurance guy, their mortgage guy, their agent from a million TikToks or interest rates dropped. Fed cut rates, right? Yeah. Half, a, half a percent or 50 basis points, however huge you want news. to. This huge is news. massive news, man. So that's the first thing that comes. And obviously a lot of people pop that up and they're like, oh, look, rates are going to drop. I would say overall rates were already reflecting based on, you know, a stock market, you know, dropping down in August around the 5th is where it kind of hit its low point. At that point, we also saw, I think, some soft softness in the unemployment market mm -hmm. or the employee, employee employment market, market the, yeah. yeah, the job support. And already in August, rates started going down versus when the Fed actually cut that half a percentage point. We didn't see too much movement, but it's they've stabilized around the very low sixes right now. Yep. And what this seems to be creating is, along with a, a lot of things, you never know what the perfect storm might be to start slowing down a market and how long that might last, is some people that are probably sitting on the fence right now to see what's going on. The market shook up in August. Now we've got an election and also some people that might be opportunistic because, well, rates, they're just going to keep on falling and I'm going to be able to get the best deal next year. That's kind of contributing to what we're seeing and advising our buyers, our sellers and our investors through right now. Do you want to kind of like dive into like what you're seeing on the buyer side? Yeah. And so to kind of talk, yeah, buyer side specifically, um, you know, I think like we've talked a lot in this podcast and we kind of joked about it too, how every month it was kind of all the same, yep. you know, like we're living in Groundhog Day. <laughs> and I feel like we kind of have been up until the last month, two months of yep. the market has kind of just been maintaining the exact same status quo for the last year and a half to two years where low inventory homes are selling super quick. Um, and it almost feels like now we're starting to see a slowdown in the demand side of things from buyers. And mm -hmm. I think a lot of that is because of uncertainty from a macroeconomic perspective with the stock market, yep. with maybe a recession coming up. Um, and we kind of predicted, you know, or maybe a lot of people predicted interest rates are going to drop. Yep. It's going to be a buyer frenzy out there. You know, like all of a sudden it's going to be interest rates are dropped. Now instead of three offers on a home, there's 10 offers on a home. And that's yep. the market we didn't want to have happen because that just, it's hard to buy a home in that situation. Right. But I think the missing piece that we didn't really understand is what's the greater economic picture going to look like when that does happen. Yeah. And I think with the uncertainty of the election, whether or not people admit to it, I think it's on the back of people's minds, you know, and the, everything's going to, cause the, the economy equation is not one plus one equals two, which is rates fall, demand goes up, home prices continue to go crazy. Right. There are a million other variables that yes. go in. Some of them, you know, I know the August, you know, stock market drop wasn't even necessarily U S driven, I think it was like currency issues over in Japan or whatever else. It's like, you never know what's going to drop. That's not even in front of our face. And the mix of honestly, a lot of sentiment from yes. the consumers that yep. then build up to this, like the interest rates are good. There's more inventory than there has been for it's a perfect, you know, uh, launching pad for the market to go off again. But now it's kind of stacked. Now it's kind of paused. Yeah. yeah. And uh, there's kind of like some different signals that I'm seeing too of, what does the economy actually look like today? Mm -hmm. um, I was one of my girlfriend about this. She works at Kohl's, so she's very in tune with the retail space. Yeah, Retail has had one of the best months in a long time, which to me is very much like a key indicator of how consumer sp sentiment is. You know, people aren't going to Target unless they want to and have the ability to do so and buy new clothes and buy like maybe those essential items that are maybe not necessarily extremely necessary like groceries, but like just above that on that yep. scale. Um, so we're seeing that has positive sign of life. But then we have noticed, kind of getting to the meat of all this, mm -hmm. um, I've noticed a big drop in demand from buyers, just yep. in general. Like anecdotally from just my client base that I'm working with, it seems like 
I have the fewest number of buyer clients that are ready to go and itching that I have in a long time. Mm-hmm. Um, I've noticed anecdotally just a lot of homes in pretty desirable areas sitting for longer, yep. for more price drops anecdotally than what I feel like we've seen this whole year. Mm-hmm. And then looking more from a true number and data perspective, pending sales to me, that I mean, that's the number of homes under contract at any given time, yep. homes that have an accepted offer. Um, that to me is a good indicator of demand in the next 30 to 60 days. Yep. Um, because those are buyers that are actually writing offers, homes going under contract. Year over year, we noticed a 15% decline in number of homes under contract. But if we just look month to month from July to August, we kind of want to see every year around this time, it's going to start to kind of decline. You know, it's the seasonality of the market. There's going to be less buyers in the winter than there are in the summer. We kind of want to just see like this gradual, nice, you know, I'm a big skier, maybe like a nice uh, green circle kind of, kind of angle going down. And we saw kind of this black diamond sort of (laughs) decline, I would say. Um, And so that to me, I see that and it only happened one month, you know, so I'm curious to see it's not a trend yet. You know, it's, Mm -hmm. it's just something we need to watch though, because if this in September in October continues and we continue to see this massive decline of homes going under contract, that to me is a big indicator of just what's the market going to look like in the future. Because we've also seen new listings be relatively flat month over month, where if all of a sudden new listings dropped, pending sales dropped, that's kind of a one-to-one ratio where, okay, inventory is still getting scooped up, but we're seeing new listings still flat. So yeah. That's the big thing that I'm seeing right here. And I think we're going to just see some weirdness in the trend. And again, like we talked last month, I think typically the drop from October to November in pending sales or, you know, coal sales because of election cycles, usually it's down 9% in a normal year. It's down 15% in past election years. Well, past election years, they only happen every four years. And this like way that marketing happens and advertising and streaming and all these different ways that people get more engaged into election cycle is a huge distraction. And like, you actually don't know, like 12 years ago, there wasn't the same amount of like attention paid Mm -hmm. potentially to these elections, or at least it's not right in your face constantly on reels and TikToks and everything else. Yeah. Could there be bigger impacts of people being super freaked out about what's going to happen next? And as soon as you get past November, and the world doesn't explode, hopefully, <laughs> it all just bounces back. And yep. we know that there will be pent up demand. That's what we've always seen in past election cycles. And I think we might see that, but how weird is the data going to look? Yep. And we're looking at local numbers versus, you know, I think the national number was down 7% pending sales August year over year versus Milwaukee here, we were down 15. So a bigger reaction to that, we did have a little bit of slowness in like the new listing activity a couple months ago. So like the newness wasn't there, Mm -hmm. but active inventory is up. The options are there. And I think we're almost just waiting for that pool of buyers that are home sellers to realize I actually now have the opportunity to get that home sale contingency again. And that might be one of the bigger unlocks as we kind of go into 2025 is actually having the the dominoes line up for people to have affordability and going from their current living situation, which might be too small or not the right fit and actually be able to get the protections of a home sale contingency. Yeah. So we'll see, mm-hmm. but I don't think they're ready to move yet at 6.15 for an interest rate. But if we get down into the fives, what is that like inflection point where yeah. that move up buyer actually comes to the market? Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> One other anecdote I have here too is I think about people that attend open houses. Sometimes people that attend open houses, they may be ready to make an offer that day. But I think the majority of people that are going to open houses are mostly that like two to three months out from actually being or, or further from actually making an offer. Um, and I've known kind of, I've seen kind of generally just speaking with other agents that have listings. I know, uh, I think Charlie had an, a listing in Wauwatosa. His open house activity was pretty slow, but we know another agent named Jake who's got a listing in Bayview, he had 25 people attend his open house in a two hour period, which is a lot of people in my opinion. So it's yep. like, there is still those, those people out there, you know, 25 people going to one open house is a lot of people. Yep. Um, so they're still there, but I just wonder if it's kind of like a 
two to three month thing versus a, a right now sort of thing. Yeah. It's probably the people starting to dabble into the market knowing next spring they're going to make the move. Yep. Like it could be sooner in of 60 to 90 days. It could be they're going to wait till after the holiday season and their parents finally, uh, you know, uh, push them hard enough to say, when are you going to become an adult and <laughs> buy a home like Grow a good up. American? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but definitely as sellers out there, we wanted that quick tip to be kind of like, what's the framework when the market slows down and like, do I need to freak out? No, like demand does slow every now and then for factors that are outside of your control. It doesn't mean the bottom's falling out. We saw prices increase again in August year over year. Prices are still going. We're still seeing closed sales still be about 85% of what they were before the market started slowing down a bit back in 2022. So it's not like it's a big crash where half of all the demand is gone. Mm -hmm. It's just slower than what we've seen for the rest of this year. And we'll see if that trend continues. Yeah. And I don't want to kind of beat this to death, but I just think like this is pretty interesting. Um, if we look from a national perspective for the, from all of the U S not just Milwaukee, um, there's an indicator that I like to look at. It's called the uh, pending home sales index. Basically, it just looks at how many homes are under contract or pending. So stay, still looking at the same measure. It's the lowest it's been right now uh, since COVID happened. So basically, if you remember in 2020, March, April time, basically the, the whole market just kind of like paused for six months. Yep. Um, that's the number that we're looking at is right around that same indicator level. So it's mm -hmm. And it hasn't really creeped up super high above that number just because inventory has been so low, but we're starting to see uh, the lowest number of homes under contract since really yeah. COVID. Here's a take for you. Just making it up as you kind of talk through that and compare it to COVID. What, what we know is like a lot of people got, you know, shelter in place, all that kind of stuff. Don't go out in public. Everyone's saving a ton of money, not doing experiences, not going out to eat. Maybe they're doing takeout. And then they did this revenge spending, right? Over the last two to three years, people have just been going hard on consumer spending. We now revenge have had, I like that. we've now had like two years of kind of like pent up people want to move and do new housing situations, but it was really hard to do so with the difference in how aggressively rates rose. Does 2025 and 2026 become the revenge spending in the housing market where now we've got more options, we've got more inventory. Now we've got a ton of pent up home sellers that also want to move up. Are we pent like got election, people are freaking out and then all of a sudden everything's fine next year. Rates come low, boom, snaps into action. I think that's something I'm, we'll, yeah, we'll have to see. We'll see. I'm not gonna call it a prediction, but is that a scenario just like, think of how many people are like, man, I'm one of these people. I would love to move to, you know, from my house hack where I live in the upper unit right now and get a little bit bigger place, but. Yeah, I don't necessarily want to increase uh, my monthly uh, housing budget by 3x. Mm -hmm. But could I maybe do two times? Yeah, we could probably make that. We could figure it out. We can grow into that payment. I'm sure I'm not the only one that feels that way. And does that unlock next year? No. Once we get to that point in time, I guess we'll have to see. Mm -hmm. So um, as we kind of look at this, so a couple of the notes as we kind of dive into rates, the election, potentially recessions, Rates are improving, meaning they're coming down. A lot of this is the Fed funds rate, which is the money being lent between banks that eventually make it its way into the economy and businesses investing into uh, growth. I think what we'll see over time is how is this going to shake out in a recession? Because unfortunately, if the recession comes, you get better rates, but it becomes a little bit harder with job loss and income. Will that also be just another counterbalance to what we're seeing in the market? You have some information here on mortgage up, uh mortgage applications, both for the refi side and the purchase side. What are we seeing right now? Yeah. So, um, rate drop, right? I think rate, rates right now around like six, one to six, yep. two yep. last year, this time, what? Seven, one, seven, two. That's right. It's like a full Down 1%. percentage de less from yep. where you were last year. Um, we've seen a massive uptick in, uh, refi applications. So about 127% more refi applications than a year ago. So that's, that's positive. It's, you know, it's a big it's trend that, change, but it's from like a historical, very low refi amount for sure. Yeah. Base is pretty low. Yeah. But then what's interesting to me, mortgage applications. So people applying for a new mortgage that don't already have a home are essentially flat to where they were a year ago. Yep. So one further indicator that I'm looking at, that's someone that's applying for a mortgage is for a new mortgage is someone that's probably looking to purchase within the next six, 90 days, 60 to 90 days, yep. um, flat from where it was a year ago. So yeah. we haven't quite seen that that further, 
I, I think that's which, an which is really interesting indicator. that you see a disconnect between yeah. applications and the pending sales. It's there's there's a similar amount of people who want to buy this year as last year based on applications, but they're not pulling the trigger on writing that offer, getting accepted. Could it be because the uncertainty we have right now, again, pending sales down 15% in August year over year. And it, it's got to be partially election driven. It's also like big drop in the market. Everyone always pauses mm-hmm. when we get that. It's already bounced recovered. I think hit yeah. all, all time highs once again. But I feel like these things always kind of operate in like a 30 day lag of people like, okay, yeah, the world didn't Yeah, we're didn't doing end. okay. Okay, we're all right. Yeah. But I know something you definitely want to go into is Fed funds rates signal and, all, you know, whenever we drop them, they signal recession. Yeah. Yeah. And I think this is something that eh, you kind of talk about how everyone has all this access now to information. You know, like you, you're laying at home on your couch, on your bed, you pull up Instagram reels, TikTok, whatever your thing is. And it's almost like we now have more access to more information, which helps accelerate whether we're feeling really good about things or really bad about things. Mm-hmm. Um, but I've seen this now come up several times. Every time the Fed has lowered rates um, that has, there's been a recession that's came in the next six months, basically. And that goes back to before the 90, 1999.com bubble crash. Um, but basically, so if, if history continues, um, rates dropping is like a potentially a signal for a recession to come. Yeah. And I think what's really important is usually everybody buckets recessions into that's everything, including the housing market. And I think most of the stats I think what we've seen is it's like seven out of the last eight recessions, the housing market actually uh, continued to go up in terms of price growth or or close sales. The only difference was the great financial recession, which was a recession caused by the real estate and lending practices and everything else and over overbuilding, oversupply. So this is a different completely different situation because especially in Milwaukee, we're still at like 50% of the inventory we had pre COVID. I think uh, we're still not at, you know, nationally, I don't think we're back at that active inventory amount. Mm -hmm. I think it's still at, you know, down 20% or so. So we're not really having that same picture of, yes, we could see recession. We could see some pain in the economy, but it doesn't necessarily translate itself one for one into the housing market. Yeah. Interesting. Though it sometimes it might gunk it up a little bit just because if people lose their jobs, it's a little bit harder to get pre-approved, though we might see some relief in interest rates. But uh, let's just do like a quick overview for a couple of these numbers. You know, new listing activity. So that's, you know, the newness coming up uh, that should impact our close sales in the future. Down two and a half percent versus a year ago. Pending sales, like we've mentioned, down 15 percent. Closed sales, August 2024 versus last year, down six percent. Days on market, flat our median sales price now sits at 360000 up 7% versus a year ago, and it's down about $20,000 versus uh, last month in July. This is common. We do typically see the summer months. We do see prices start to fall. We've kind of talked. This kind of usually depends based on the content inventory that is listed, so very typical to see month-over-month month decline. And then finally, our months of supply – Nick and I's favorite metric overall, sitting at two months of supply versus 1.7 months last year, still very much half as much inventory to supply Mm -hmm. the demand. Yes, we've seen an increase versus last year. We keep on bumping between this 1.7 to 2.1. Over the next couple of months, when we see these pending sales start to slow down, do we see an inventory buildup? Do we start to see this creeping up towards the threes? That's the main metric to watch right now. Yeah, and I think... Talking about months of supply too. You said Milwaukee's what at two percent, two, two months of two supply. Point, yep. Um, nationally, the U.S. is at just over four months of supply. Mm-hmm. Um, about the highest it's been in the last four years too. Mm-hmm. So it's Milwaukee's so fascinating to me how it's such a discrepancy yeah. between what's happening at a national scale, which is even more important to if you're looking to make a move, buy a home, sell a home, to focus on your local market because a lot of what you're seeing from like CNBC, wherever you get your news, they're not going to care about Milwaukee. There's yep. way more sales volume happening in New York City, in California, in Florida, just from a home price perspective and number of homes out there that that's yep. always going to be the topic. But it's a it's a big discrepancy. And does that then make its way down to the Midwest at some point? We'll yep. see. But and Rory Gold, you know, our SVP of uh, growth here at Compass, 
he uh, gave us a big stat uh, yeah. launch here today, and it says right here in one of his reports, national reporting is a huge generalization of values, conditions, and trends across thousands of markets. Yep. Like, yep. that's the best way. So it's kind of, that's why we like focus on this. And if you look at like our, you know, content we make here and we go through Milwaukee market and compare it to, I have some agents that I, that I connect with down in the Austin market. It's completely different because yeah. they're at like six months of supply, like three X the inventory compared to the demand of here. They're talking about a whole bunch of different dynamics and strategies than what even matter here in the Milwaukee area. So it really does matter to kind of drill in locally. And it's also crazy speaking with it. I mean, you just spent a weekend in Chicago with some of the top agents around the U.S. And that's going to be super interesting hearing these different people talk about that. You know, like you talk to someone from Austin, ask him, hey, how's the market? You know, like the, <laughs> the softball question and his answer is going to be so different than someone in LA, someone here in Milwaukee. Or like an agent I spoke to that's in Naples, like that one of their main thing is, she said, not even second homes, fourth homes. Oh, is the one fourth of market, home market. The fourth home market. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and like even in the secondary home market, like financing changed over the last couple of years with like the loan level price adjustments make it way more expensive. Sometimes you have to put a little bit more money down, like versus, you know, three years ago. Second homes were relatively easy, 10% yeah. down, rates were pretty attractive. Like some of these markets get indirectly affected based on changes in the financing versus we're a very kind of run of the mill, yeah. single family homes, duplexes, all that kind of stuff. Like that, there's so many intricates that go into each individual local market. Yeah. And it comes down to a lot of different factors. But very quickly to hit on our two family duplex space, uh, we're sitting at two months of supply, similar to what we have in the single family space. Uh, actually less than last year at 2.2. And then our median sales price, 211,000 up almost 10% versus a year ago with our days on market sending, still sitting in the single digits at nine days. So more or less prices going up, a little bit more demand than what we saw a year ago and still seeing homes get uh, put under contract just as fast as a year ago too. And rents sitting at a 1,200 rents on average for a two bedroom, one bath apartment here in the Milwaukee County area. So we continue to see this trickle up a little bit over time. Anything you want to, you know, sprinkle into the investment market here? Um, I've noticed that anecdotally more, a lot of sellers being very uh, optimistic about what their home is worth from mm -hmm. a duplex perspective. Yeah. Um, I think it's kind of like, yeah, if I can sell it at this price, it'd be hard to take down an offer, hard to be refuse it. Um, it is interesting though, looking at, um, Pending listings, I feel like I've said that word a thousand times in this podcast <laughs> here. Um, pending listings are up um, this month, year to date, or uh, this month. No, down 36. Down 36. Excuse me. I was looking at the year to date Yeah, number. year to date. Year up to date seven, that's a huge seven. trend. Up seven year to date for homes that have gone under contract versus last, last month in August, down 36. And I would definitely say investors are a little bit more known for knee jerk of no rates, Rates aren't good. I'm out. I'm not going to buy right now. I'm going to wait and see. Like, I'm very smart. I know all of my numbers, everything else. And it's my spreadsheet says no. Mm -hmm. It's interesting to see how quickly they react to essentially a market drop. Boom. I'm out. I'm going to yep. sit on the sideline. Yep. <clears throat> interesting. Yeah. Love, love me some data. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So. What other stats are you looking for more information on? Ask us in the comments below. We'd love to give you our take on what's coming next in the real estate market. Yeah. So next, hopefully you got some uh, some uh, news articles for us. It looks a little blank here <laughs> on our uh, Yeah, we got a, a nice uh, Google Doc, Google slide that we put together every month for this. And, and it's uh, blank. It's blank. But you know what isn't blank? My mind right now. Okay. Always Great. got something in my mind. So I think uh, I want to talk about Airbnbs okay. with you here. Um, I've heard of them. Yeah, you know Airbnbs, yeah. short-term rentals, Verbo right? VRBO, whatever. Uh, so there's been a lot of chatter in the Milwaukee area of regulations coming to Airbnbs. And this all got prompted because there's been complaints from neighbors about Airbnb properties being, having parties being a nuisance, you know, yeah. like people coming and going, people being loud, maybe people like abusing an Airbnb a lot and of these hosting a party. Generated from the Republican National Convention that was here back in July. It's like, yeah, that one big event that we do every four years that now has got everybody thinking, we got to change everything. Yeah. And yeah. so this got brought up at a city council meeting in June or July, where basically someone approached at the council meeting to an alderman that, that all these issues that there's been with Airbnbs in the city and basically saying that we need to regulate Airbnbs and short-term rentals in general. And then used kind of a, a soft case study as compared to Madison mm -hmm. 
where Madison's regulations with Airbnbs is you can only Airbnb out your home if you're living there and you're occupying the home. So and basically you're there during the stay. Exactly. Mm-hmm. So you're looking at like renting out bedrooms essentially yep. versus a whole home. And there, as you can imagine, are significantly less problems that arise from those because the owner is there during the stay. So you're yep. not going to have a big project X style party. Yep. Um, and so then, then basically the aldermen, there's, I think seven or eight different aldermen in Milwaukee based on the district you're in. And one of them was basically like, this is a no brainer. You know, we, why not? Like, yeah, no brainer is, is the actual word yep. that he used. Um, so a lot of chatter then came out from this meeting about how it, for a while, it sounded like it was imminent to happen. Um, and then the latest that I've heard is basically there is potentially a proposal to hit, to be under review, to either approve or deny with that look of regulation. I've heard it's unlikely it's to pass from my inside sources, but that's about the latest that we have right now is that it's in talks. Um, And then there's been a lot of, I would say, backlash and a lot of strong voices on both sides. Um, But let's just kind of talk about this. Like, what's your thoughts on this? My my first thought is you know, aldermen, uh, inevitably they're essentially politicians. And if they have, you know, their local residents that report up to them and say issues, they want to go fix it. Even though I think there's, like you said, several aldermen that represent the different parts of Milwaukee. It's like, if it's an issue for one alderman, it might not be for the rest of them, but the other ones might want to support, but it's almost like a political move. Look how extreme of action we took when we don't have to go ditch to ditch it, because right now we have very limited regulations, if not any at all, why do we have to go from very little to the most extreme regulations that there kind of are out there, not to the New York city level, but pretty aggressive to where it's, it's going to remove a lot of optionality for people that might only have maybe a condo or something like that. That's here that they're here to snowbird and it could impact their actually ability to uh, keep that property maybe they just stop coming back to Milwaukee at all. And there's some like economic impacts that go to like Milwaukee's not your destination city. We've always called it like a regional city. People drive here. They don't necessarily fly here for the events, bachelor parties, bachelorette, wedding, all those different things that could put an impact at us being able to support events like March Madness, like RNC, DNC. There's a bigger impact that can actually happen from just going ditch to ditch. Yeah, I agree. And I think there are, probably more regulations that the city could do that would make it a better environment for the neighbors that aren't Airbnb owners, you know? Like, does that mean you need to file it with the city? That there's an inspection that happens every year that maybe like a a three strikes you're out kind of policy. I don't know what that looks like, but I think there's other alternatives to just what they're proposing. Some other data that I've uncovered here too is during Milwaukee's peak season of travel, Milwaukee is short about 2,500 hotel units mm-hmm. that Airbnb helps to supplement. And so I think the biggest hotel in Milwaukee is about 400 hotel units. So we would need to build five additional hotels, the biggest hotels that Milwaukee has in order to meet that demand during those busy seasons. So there's one thing, but I think more too, for me, we talked about Milwaukee, what the 2030 plan? What was that? 2040. 2040 plan. Mm-hmm. And they want Milwaukee to be this bustling city this community. And I think part of that is tourism, attracting people to come to visit Milwaukee, to help our local economy, to eventually maybe move here too. And I think removing Airbnbs or like not letting those people come to Milwaukee that want to have that whole house to themselves kind of feel to me, it's kind of a back, it's a step in the wrong direction for Milwaukee as a whole city. Yeah, It's kind of like showing that Milwaukee isn't very progressive in my opinion, it'd be kind of like if Milwaukee wouldn't allow Ubers, you know, it's like, okay, so we're stuck using taxis Taxis. like, or lime scooters or limes. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) In the winter, get get some beefy tires. Yeah. Yeah. Some knobs and whatnot. Yeah. So I think like there's regulations that this city probably should take with Airbnb, but I don't think that's the right answer to it. Um, Maybe I'm a little bit biased because I do own an Airbnb and I rent it out and it's nice, but I also think of it as we're providing a service to people. Like when my family comes and visit, whenever my family goes to visit anywhere, we're staying at an Airbnb because we want to have that togetherness that yeah. you, you don't get that in a hotel of the, the hangout space, the camaraderie. So I just think Milwaukee is doing a disservice to its own city yeah. by moving to that sort of regulation. 
Yeah, at the end of the day, I feel like it's like one of my favorite phrases. If you're curious about why something is the way that it is, follow the money. And just like we have a lot of managers and, you know, local you know landlords that want to keep short term rentals, it's because it's it's good, it's profitable. And we, honestly, we're local businessmen that and women that want to put our returns back into it. It's like you have an Airbnb, it makes you want to go do it again, make profits in your business, hire contractors, buy furnishings, hire cleaners. And there's a whole economic thing that you do versus building another 400 unit or five, 400 unit uh, hotels. Yeah. Who's that going to be like uh, the Ritz Carlton, like some big companies, international conglomerates, those profits aren't coming back here, but guess what? Those hotels have a pretty big lean on things that happen. Taxes, yeah. you know, everything else that follow the money, who's going to have the bigger push or the bigger plan. But it really like most things should land somewhere in the middle where it's allowed. There's restrictions that keep it safe and helpful and we'll have to see how that shakes out in the negotiations that kind of come underway. Yeah. It should be something, but it shouldn't be ditch to ditch. Yeah, I agree. <clears throat> what else you got? Uh, that was the main thing from the local news here. I do, I guess, um, mm -hmm. do you have anything? Because I could find out. Uh, there's one other article, too, that uh, if you give me a good. Oh, you're on the spot. 30 seconds. We're not cutting this. You got to roll. We're not, we're not cutting this? No. Okay, okay. Hold on. Hold on. I've got a whole uh, Google Doc here. This one is called RNC Economic Impact. Milwaukee Hotels see boom. Data still coming out. Um, and so I think like we, have we talked about this in the podcast about like was the RNC a success for the economy or not? Yeah. I think it was more of like we, we heard some local restaurants and then like I think the biggest impact we saw is like you're like everyday coffee shops because everyone avoided downtown that yeah. lives in Milwaukee. But what was the actual impact is unknown of how much economic impact came from outside of Milwaukee residents themselves during yeah. this time frame. Yeah. Um, so I think it's like, we're still kind of seeing the data that's come out from this. Mm -hmm. um, I hope that it's positive because I do think the more kind of in, uh, like events that Milwaukee can put on like this, that people are supportive of in general, that's what attracts and makes the city bustling. Like you mentioned March Madness. Yeah. And like these kind of events need to be successful and there needs to be like an economic benefit from it to get the people on board to it too. Um and so it looks like the hotels did well. Um, a lot of catering companies, um, mm -hmm. Pfizer Forum, you know, they made 5.7 million to rent that out. Good so like, them. that's kind of nice. But I think uh, where, so here we go. Um, hotels saw 39% boost. Um, restaurants and bars saw 2.9% drop, mm. which I think that was probably going to be that, I think that's kind of a surprise to people. You know? it's, it's almost a trade-off, right? It's like it, they essentially, you only have so many seats you can fill in a restaurant. And how many of these turned into big events where people were being fed at the convention center, at bigger parties? I know that when we travel for work conventions and stuff, it's everyone wants to host a party at their Airbnb or an event and host food. And you're not necessarily always getting the opportunity to go do these you know, big restaurant reservations because everyone's a little bit concerned of, am I even gonna be able to get a reservation yeah. to begin with? And you find other solutions. Mm -hmm. hmm. Yeah. Super interesting. Yeah. Well, next up, what we have is just some of our national topics, you know, some of the, the data's data points we like to track. National inventory right now sits around 900,000 homes. Again, as we kind of came into COVID, we were sitting around that number. So getting close to back to that national inventory amount, <clears throat> Our, uh, mor our mortgage purchase index, this is like new applications coming in. It's still lower than it's been, you know, at the lower point that we've seen in the last couple of decades. It has not recovered back to where we saw applications between 2020 to 2023. And then move on to our Zillow index. We're seeing that Milwaukee, for that typical home price, con consistently is showing at up 5% at 4.9, kind of sitting in the middle of the pack of this kind of like top 20 uh, markets that are growing. Uh, top markets growing right now, San Jose, California, Hartford, Connecticut, Providence, Rhode Island. So not necessarily big name markets, some of those more fringe markets that are kind of suburbs around some of those bigger locations. And then you've got the, the rent side of things up 5.3% here in Milwaukee, sitting in kind of just outside that top five. Some of the bigger markets that we're seeing rents increase, Virginia Beach, Cincinnati, Ohio, Kansas City, Detroit, St. Louis. So a lot and then outside of Virginia. Right there. And then Milwaukee. Columbus. A next. lot of those Rust Belt. And yeah. I know that these are some markets that we're still seeing a lot of uh, low vacancy rates, meaning 
you know, rentals are de definitely very much in demand right now. And we're seeing, you know, a lot of those larger rentals come in here. <clears throat> Next up, we see inflation rate down to two and a half uh, percent versus a year ago in terms of prices raising last month at 2.9. We're getting closer and closer to that 2% Fed target. It looks like their forecast was sitting at 2.7. So again, they beat that forecast, which is why we actually saw that flow through of the Fed making the decision of not just a quarter of a point in rate drop, but a half. And they're trying to land this plane now as we mm -hmm. get closer and closer. And we don't want to have uh, the economy come to a, a skid as that kind of breaks out, so again, we are still seeing core inflation, which includes shelter, um, a lot of those things like minus food and energy, which are more volatile, sitting at 3.2, with shelter sitting at 5.2. So again, shelter being one of the bigger buckets and also being one of the stickiest because of the leasing done in 12-month increments. <clears throat> then we look at mortgage rates. We've mentioned this already. The average as of uh, September 18th was a 6.15 versus last year, September 14th, we're at 7.15. So down one point versus a year ago, finally getting to the sixes. I know I actually saw a pre-approval come across recently for an FHA buyer, which typically have better rates. Uh, they had a pre-approval for a 4.99. Amazing. Yeah. You have to pay wow. some points and stuff and some, some pricing to actually get down to that rate for the long term. Yeah. The APR was still up in the fives, but starting to see some relief here in the rates. Unemployment rate, starting to get a little, you know, trickling up a little bit more, yep. sitting at 4.2 nationally uh, here in Wisconsin, still sitting at a three. So doing well locally. Again, that's another thing that's going to be very local overall, but anything you, you want to hit on before we kind of march off to the last segment? I would say inflation at 2.5% is the lowest it's been in the last three years, two, three years. I don't know. Just make it up. Yeah. yeah that sounds right. I mean, it's the lowest it's been in the last year yeah. by far. So I think that's the big indicator as to why. And so we'll see if this spikes up again. I don't feel like it's going to honestly. Um, but, and then also I think it's kind of interesting too, that you mentioned uh, shelter for uh, inflation up 5.2%. And if you look at the Zillow observed rent index for, is this Milwaukee 5.3 or is this everywhere? Um, that's, yep. That's, that's Milwaukee from Milwaukee. Yeah, yeah. So our, uh, the inflation number for shelter is up 5.2 and from Milwaukee it's up 5.3. So basically right in the line. same. Yeah. Yeah. Kind Very of crazy. Interesting. Almost like these numbers actually make sense. <laughs> yeah. It's fun when things actually line up. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Well, what's new, man? You what, got a beautiful mustache. Got a beautiful mustache. Yeah. What is new? Um, I was just in Indianapolis last weekend. Uh, had a bachelor party down there. Went to a Bears game. So we got to see uh, Caleb Williams, the future of the Bears franchise threw for over 350 yards last wow. weekend, which is the most for a rookie quarterback in Bears history. Mm -hmm. um, so that was kind of fun. They lost know? though, right? They <laughs> <laughs> pretty bad, right? Yeah, I mean, but, it, was, it wasn't, wasn't pretty. But, but, <laughs> but he threw yards. He threw, threw, threw a lot of yards. Yeah, so that was a good time. Just a bunch of buddies that I uh, haven't seen in a while. Got to catch up with them. Um, we all, we all did mustaches, got the Ditka glasses, and then mm -hmm. like, seven of the guys wore the full Ditka outfit with like the sweater vest and the khakis and the, bears. the tie, the Da Bears look. And then I went with like the SNL skit, like the hat, you know, the sweater, yeah. like kind of more of that style. Um, we were out tailgating before and I kid you not, man, every 30 seconds, someone stopped us to take a photo with us <laughs> and just like walk into the stadium. It was so funny. Like looking at people being like, Oh, look at, look at the Ditkas, look at the yeah, Ditkas. That's great. Um, so that was a cool highlight. Uh, Indianapolis versus Milwaukee. What's your take? Uh, Milwaukee to me is just a way better city Easy, all, all, right. all over. Yeah. I think Indy has a really good suburb called Carmel, mm -hmm. which is like renowned across the U S as being the top suburb in like the universe. But, um, yeah, from a downtown <laughs> perspective, from an activity perspective, I think Milwaukee bar none is a more vibrant and exciting city. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. like after eight o'clock in the morning on a, a Saturday, Sunday, Milwaukee's alive. I remember yes. I went to Indianapolis. This was several years ago and I was like 10 AM and I'm like, where, where is everyone? <laughs> where is everyone? They don't yeah, have like it's a, a downtown like a, it's like a community. Suburb it's a thing, suburb you know? city. Which is why much. we got the 2040 plan here in Milwaukee just to keep on building on, you know, yeah. one of our already strengths. Uh, well, what's new with you, man? Nothing. I, I've got nothing to report on this month, <laughs> <laughs> except for the old, the you old look, marriage. You look different. Look a little heavier. You got some jewelry on today yeah, that you weren't right. wearing last month. Yeah, so so got married, which was amazing. 
uh, took a, like 10 days off. So I feel a little bit disconnected from the world. <laughs> so that's why I'm kind of making this up as I go, leaning on you heavy to tell me what the hell happened in the world the last uh, 10 days or so. But it was an awesome, uh, awesome day. You got to come join and yeah. celebrate with us. Uh, some of the highlights I would say is beautiful weather. Uh, had a great venue on the lake down in Bayview, which is, you know, great suburb. Uh, got a mosh pit during the wedding. Got lifted twice. <laughs> got sprayed down with beer. I mean, it's about everything you could uh, uh, hope for uh, on a wedding day. Yeah. Uh, what, was, what was the top top uh, feature of the night? Um, I would say it's always cool meeting, like going to a wedding and then meeting the people that were like, important to your life, you know? Mm -hmm. um, like I've known you for the last, what, like eight years, you know? Yeah. And we got to know each other pretty well these last like three, four, I would say. But it's always fun getting to know like the people that kind of made you. And to no surprise, like all your friends are the nicest dudes of all time. <laughs> and I got to hang out with them at the bachelor party too. So I think that was more, it was just like hanging out with everyone, meeting your parents was mm -hmm. fun. Yeah. Um, your sister. So yeah, it was a, uh, it was a very fun wedding. Ashley and I had a ton of fun. It was probably, I don't know who's going to listen to this at other the weddings I've been to, but it was probably the most fun wedding we've been to. Yeah. We'll, 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 we'll make sure that we <laughs> yeah, keep that yeah, on the yeah. DL. Uh, the, the last stat, I'll, I'll wrap this up with this very last stat. Everyone's always curious. So this was a DIY kind of venue. So we bought all of our own uh, alcohol, hired all our vendors. So I did some research, did some calculators that are out there online. Uh, you know, you put in essentially, you know, uh, what level of drinkers do you have? Average, above average, heaviest, the heaviest kicks out. It's like five and a half drinks per person. So I'm like, we are in Wisconsin. So we went out, you know, we bought about nine drinks per person across wine, liquor, beer, everything else. And we got about 75% through it. So wow. my recommendation to the, uh, the drink calculators out there for people trying to plan a wedding, you have to put a new level on it called Wisconsin. <laughs> <laughs> so <clears throat> I don't think we really ran everything. The the brandy old fashions were flowing. Oh, that's uh, funny. The pineapple margaritas were were a hit, and uh, I think uh, we got cleaned out of Spotted Cow pretty quickly for the people that were coming yeah. from out of state. So, was there anything that I like, just didn't even get touched? Uh, not not a big wine night, and that's what we heard from the the, the caterer bartender crew. They're like, "You just don't know what's going to be a hit and what yeah. people are going to go for." So, yeah, great that's night. Funny. So that's the last uh, data point uh, that yeah, I, I would have say for Wisconsin you. Wisconsin might be the highest, and then. You didn't mention that it's Wisconsin rugby players, which yes. is probably another notch yeah, up from an that. Ex, an extra tier. Yeah, yeah, there should be modifiers inside yeah. this calculator. Yeah. We're going to have to go make a new calculator. Okay. Yeah, yeah, we're going to have to do our own. But, hey, if you found uh, value in the information we just covered about the Milwaukee area and how to uh, properly uh, stock your uh, wedding bar, <laughs> please subscribe, hit that bell notification so that, we know, so that you know when we post our next market update. Thanks, and we'll be back again next month with the Milwaukee market update. Bye, guys.